about y'all but I love it when he bangs on those keys right there at the end of it the uh, uh, big time God is good and all the time amen the gospel prospers during the good times and the bad oftentimes more during the bad times because that's when we look up and look around and we know that we must have God if we're going to move forward we're going to be talking about something today that is a uh, um, a little bit different, and that's that Jesus teaches on sin. You know, not every single sermon and every single text is necessarily about sin, but the sin that we're going to talk about today is the sin of pride. Man, and Lord willing, we're going to cover Mark chapter 9, verses 30 through 41. If you would open your Bible up or turn them on and follow along in the text. I'm actually looking forward to sharing with you today because I, I think that it can really help our church with what God has in store. But I want to tell you that in so many ways, it's a preventive sermon. All right. This, this is something that, that we, we, as of right now, as far as I'm aware of, don't have any type of huge problem with. But I also want you to know that it can sneak up on us in a hurry at the, here at the church at the beach. I also want you to know that in your relationships, your marriages, your relationship with your father, the relationship with your son or with your daughter or with your mother or with, with your coworkers, all of those relationships value, all of them have value and they're important they're important because their ways in which, those are the ways in which you lead people to Christ. And so, folks, pride gets in the way. And there's going to be some things that I say today that maybe hit you wrong. And guess what? When I was studying, they hit me wrong too. So I promise you, you might not be the only one to get a little angry with what's coming. But I really think that when we leave, we can be better off than when we came today. You know, as a pastor, you go through a lot of things, just like in all of y'all's vocations and jobs. You go through all sorts of different things. And this week, we had, we had a church member pass away. And it's hard on that family. And, and I know that this might seem a little odd or weird, but that is not necessarily hard or difficult for me. The hard part is seeing a family hurting and suffering. That is is difficult and that hurts but but the death very rarely bothers me anymore in and of itself that person's faith is sealed i'll either see them in heaven or i won't man it's kind of odd but the family that's hurting that's tough i had to go and and, and and handle a situation this week that somewhat would fall under the church discipline type mentality and that's kind of difficult, but, but I don't dread doing that because I have nothing inside of me that gives me any doubt about it is what God has called me to do. And I hope that each of you have those same type passions and feelings and that type of mentality towards where God has you in life. But I'll tell you what I don't enjoy doing as a pastor. And that's dealing with people's pride. And it's aggravating. 
And I know there are a lot of sins that I could come up here and I could beat on this podium and I can hoot and holler and I could get everybody fired up and roused up and amen in me. And I'm probably not going to hear any amens today. I'm aware of that. Amen. But folks, all of these sins that I could come preach against, all of these sins that I could come and get up here on my high horse because I would never do a sin like that. And so I can talk bad about those sins with confidence. Guess what? And on Monday, I was in a meeting with the pastors of Southern Baptist churches in Gulf, Bay, and Franklin counties. And you know what? As we were talking about things and issues that we need and we're praying about to get corrected in our churches, is that those things that I could get y'all all fired up and amening about, rarely, if ever, do I have a church member come and they are committing that sin? But guess what? The one that I won't get amens about is the problem and the sin that I have to deal with on a weekly basis. And that is the sin of pride. Because we want things our way, right away, right now. And we have learned, and I'll cover this and say, we have learned as Christians... Whether it be in our marriages, like I said, whether it be dealing with our parents, whether it be dealing with co-workers or employees, we have learned to twist things and have this special talk and jargon to disguise whatever it is so that we can't just come in and say, I've got my own pride problem. And so I've got to figure out how to just love everybody else. Because I want my way. So with that being said, I want you to know that I try to be like Jesus. And it seems to me that Jesus handled sin in a pretty specific way. And, and God handled sin in a pretty specific way all the way from Genesis 1 all the way to the end of the book of Revelation. But I want to make sure we all understand why do we sin? And I want you to know that all week as I was studying, I was preaching to myself and under conviction. You understand that? So this is not some preacher up here yelling and screaming at you because y'all are bad and I'm good. It's that I've had seven days of dealing with this and I guess today's when it all pours out. Why do you sin? I sin and you sin because you make the decision that you know better for you than God knows for you. You see, you know right and wrong if you're a saint you know that God's way is over here, and you know that your way is over here. And you come to some conclusion. Now, how deeply you think about it from time to time, I can't say. But you come to a conclusion that God's way is not going to give me what I want. And so I'm going to go over here to my way and do it this way. And then you sin. And you think you're going to get what you want. And then it crumbles. Because that's what sin does to us. You see, God is not looking for the proud. And he is not looking for you to have great pride. God is looking for you to have humility. And he's looking for me to have humility. So let's look at the definitions right out of a, a, of a dictionary. Pride, a higher inordinate opinion of one's own dignity, importance, merit, or superiority. Whether it's cherished in the mind or displayed in conduct. How about humility? This is what God's looking for. The quality or condition of being humble. Modest opinion or estimate of one's own importance, rank, etc. So preaching truth the way Jesus did. I have to tell you, it seems to me that with lost people, that when Jesus was dealing with them, or when Jesus was dealing with even people that had faith in God, but they were struggling and they weren't making the best decisions, that Jesus was firm, but he was never mean, or a separatist. And I want you to know that when Jesus was dealing with the religious elites, or the people full of pride, the people that thought that they were better than others, the people that thought they were smarter than others, the people that thought that they were holier than others, you know what Jesus did with them? He went straight at their throat. That's what Jesus did. He wasn't putting up with that pride. Because Jesus knew I'm better than any of you. I'm God. And you're not going to act like you're better than other people around me and me not correct it. Sometimes we think Jesus' culture is different than our culture, and in some ways it was, but in some ways it wasn't. That culture is, is, is messed up just like ours was messed up. Fallen human nature corrupts people's approach to life. 
We are still battling for pride. We are still battling for power. We are still battling for money. And again, at the church, we have learned how to twist words and, and kind of come over the top and, and twist things to make it sound like we don't. But really what it is, is I want my way because my way's best and everybody else's way is wrong. And that's not just true in a church. It is true in every relationship as we're going to see later today. So we've got to get rid of this pride, this sin that causes all kinds of problems. But we still have to preach the truth. The culture is similar in so many ways. Now I have a story. I was reading this book and great theologian, John MacArthur, maybe one of the brightest Christian minds alive today, especially in America. And, and Brother Barry comes in, we're meeting about something else, and I was like, hey man, I read this. This is exactly what I'm trying to say on Sunday. And so I'm going to read this paragraph to you just like I read it to him. But I've got to warn you, when I finished, his eyes were real big, and he was like, what? So I'm going to read it because I need to give him credit for what he said. And he said it, actually, he did say it better than me. But if this, if you pay real close attention, if this doesn't resonate with you, I'm going to say it with how big old Terry Powell, my daddy, said it when I was a kid as he was taking that leather belt to teach me a lesson, all right, when I got too prideful. So you can either take the, the great scholarly theologian's way or old country boy's way, but I just want you to get the point. Every fallen human heart is a relentless worshiper of itself. That's all of us. Fallen human nature is dominated by pride. But in a bizarre twist, our society diagnoses the cause of people's problems as a lack of pride or self-esteem. Such is not the case. However, no one lacks self-esteem. Everyone is consumed with himself or herself to one degree or another. To diagnose the cause of all human ills as a lack of self-esteem leads people to be even more prideful than they already are. Inflating pride under the guise of promoting self-esteem as a psychological benefit exposes people to pride's devastating consequences, including defilement, dishonor, strife, and most significantly, God's judgment. That is contrary to everything that our modern-day psychiatrists and psychologists would ever tell us. What Jesus is teaching in this passage and what we can receive and learn from his word is contrary to what you have always been told and possibly what you have thought. But I do want, if that got a little wordy and bogged down, I do want to share with you a lesson that teaches the same lesson that my dad shared with me when I was a kid. A lot of times. When I started to feel bad about whatever, he would remind me that you don't need others or yourself to give you more self-esteem. You need to rely on God. Accomplish something for the kingdom. And then you still might not feel better about who you are. But J-Boy, you'll feel better about whose you are. Saying the same things, just with a different level of education, right? Sometimes you can learn the same things on the farm that you can, down by the creek that you can in the seminary. Sometimes. Folks, pride is not what God's looking for. He's looking for humility. And through the Old Testament and the New Testament, I want to share some of these verses with you if I can, if we can get them up on the screen. I think the first one's in Isaiah. Yeah, thank you. Isaiah 66, verses 1 and 2. Thus says the Lord, heaven is my throne and earth is my footstool. Where is the house that you will build me? And where is the place of my rest? For all those things my hand is made and all those things exist, says the Lord. But on this one will I look. I'm saying, I created all this. But on this one I will look, on him who is poor and of a contrite spirit and who trembles at my word. Hmm. He's not looking for pride. He's looking for humility. How about in Micah chapter 6 verse 8? He has shown you, O oh man, what is good. And what does the Lord require of you but to do justly, to love mercy, and to walk humbly with your God? Not pride. Humility. 
New Testament, Luke chapter 14, verse 11. For whoever exalts himself will be humbled, and he who humbles himself will be exalted. If you want to get big, get small. Ephesians chapter 4, verse one, verses 1 and 2. I therefore, the prisoner of the Lord, beseech you to walk worthy of the calling with which you were called. With all lowliness and gentleness, with long suffering, bearing with one another in love. Let nothing be done through selfish ambition or conceit. But in lowliness of mind, let each esteem others better than himself. Philippians 2. Colossians 3.12, therefore, as the elect of God, that's us, that's the church, we're the elect. Holy and beloved, put on tender mercies, kindness, humility, meekness, long-suffering. Then the last one, 1 Peter chapter 5, verse 5. Likewise, you younger people, submit yourselves to your elders. That doesn't mean old people. That means, actually, in that word, it means the elders of the church. Yes, all of you be submissive to one another. But that's all of us, be submissive to one another. And be clothed with humility. Then the quote, God resists the proud, but gives grace to the humble. Do you want God to resist you, or do you want God's grace to pour out on you? Make that decision, and then that will dictate how you behave in your relationships with others, and of course here at the church too. Three expectations from today's sermon. We're going to quickly break down God's word. One is, I think that there are people here that have soft hearts that are going to be here and they're going to listen and be open and their soft heart is going to be changed because of God's word and the proclamation of it. I think that there are going to be people here that have hard hearts and they're going to be angry with me because I don't know everything that I'm talking about and there's a reason that they're so prideful and blah, 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 blah to rationale their behavior and thoughts. And so their hard hearts will get angry. And then there's a third way that people are going to take this today. They're going to come up after, after the service and shake my hand and say, Hey, good job, Brother Jay. Brother Bobby over there really needed to hear this one. <laughs> All three, I know it's coming. But we've got to get rid of our pride. Let's break it down. Verses 30 through 33 of Mark in chapter 9. Humility, the example, Jesus Christ. Then they departed from there and passed through Galilee. And Jesus did not want anyone to know it. For he taught his disciples and said to them, The Son of Man is being betrayed into the hands of men, and they will kill him. And after he is killed, he will rise on the third day. So again, Christ, we, we've been going through Mark. Christ tells them about this again. But they did not, talk about the apostles, they, but they did not understand this saying and were afraid to ask him. Then he came to Capernaum, and when he was in the house, he asked them, What was it you disputed among yourselves on the road? And so after the, the transfiguration of Christ, and he's come down and he's healed the boy, and now, now they're continuing on this road. But here's the point of the example that Jesus sets and what he has just shared with them. And in your relationships, goodness gracious, if I could get this through my thick head, and if I could get it through, I'm sorry, but I'm going to say it, y'all's thick heads. It's this. For Sister Daphne to be the Christian she's supposed to be, you're going to have to suffer, Lynette. In order for that baby boy to grow up and put his faith in Christ, Brother Rusty, you're going to have to suffer some. In order for my grandbabies to put faith in Christ, life ain't going to be that easy. But if you expect the people around you to grow, take a deep breath and understand that you must suffer. You know why? Because that's exactly what Christ had to do for us to get to where we're supposed to go. He had to suffer. Delivered. He was going to be handed over. And sometimes I tell y'all, and, 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 and this is true, in one aspect it's totally true. Sometimes I tell y'all, don't blame it on the Roman soldiers or their government, and don't blame it on the Jews. Jesus Christ had to go to the cross because you killed him, because of your sin. 
And while that's true on so many levels, I also don't want you to get too prideful about that. It wasn't about you. It was about a preordained plan from before time began that God the Father was going to send Jesus Christ, God the Son, to die on the cross for sin of human and for the church to be forgiven. Don't you forget that. This plan of, of redemption, it pertains to you, but it's not all about you. It's about him. And I also just want to make sure you understand, I try to say this every time that Jesus asked a question. He asked them old boys a question, but he wasn't asking it because he needed knowledge. Jesus is God. He already knows. But in order for relationships to grow and people to grow, he communicated with them in the way we communicate here on earth. Let's look at verse 34. Disrupting unity is a sin. How about that? I hear it all the time in the preaching circles I, I run in. I hear about people saying, you know, oh, don't worry about unity, don't worry about unity. Knock people upside the head, tell them about their sin. I disagree. I believe Christ prayed for his church to have unity just before he went to the cross because he knows how hard it is here on this earth. I believe that Paul, throughout the letters, he prayed and taught for the church to have unity. We are firm against sin, but we absolutely do not say, oh, forget sin, because we want to tell people how awful they are. Verse 34, disrupting unity is a sin of itself. But they, the apostles, kept silent. They didn't answer Jesus. Why? Because they knew that they had been wrong. For on the road they had disputed among themselves... Who would be the greatest? We have this. Who will be the greatest? Again, Christians have learned how to speak religiously. And so when we don't get our way, we don't come in and say, I want it my way. We come in and say, blah, 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 blah. Again, the toughest part. But guess what? It's not just about this church. This is just the example because the word is teaching about God's people being in relationship with other of God's people. Others that are God's. But this pertains to all of your relationships. We break it down, we break it down, we break it down, and it all ends up being about pride. And today's Christians can cover it up pretty well, whether it be in church or in your everyday relationships. But Christ prayed for unity. And in summary, pride destroys relationships. If you think back, maybe you've been divorced. Maybe you're not divorced, but you think you're about to be divorced. Maybe you are currently estranged from your son or from your daughter or from your mother or your father. Or maybe you despise a previous boss or maybe a previous boss despises you. But all of that came about because of pride from one person or another. So in summary, pride destroys relationships. And then we see that pride leads to a loss of respect. Verse 35, and Jesus sat down. That's what rabbis would do at the time in order to teach. So he sat down. He was going to be making a point. He called the 12 and said to them, if anyone desires to be first, he shall be last of all and servant of all. You heard me say it earlier. If you want to be big, you got to get small. But do you really think that everyone ever has liked his or her master. We read this and we will say, yeah, but Jesus, you don't know my boss. Are you kidding me? You think that Jesus doesn't know who your boss is inside and out? Of course he does. Do you think that Jesus doesn't know your coworker inside and out? Does it, do you think that Jesus doesn't know your spouse inside and out? Do you think that Jesus doesn't know your old God-forsaken preacher inside and out? But guess what? You to me and me to you, we still must serve each other because that's what Christ commanded us to do. Humility, not pride. Even if we don't like it. Because that's what we're told to do. And it takes away honor because when you're prideful, people quit liking you. When you're prideful, people think less of you. And I'm guilty of this right here, folks. Once I hear you out about four or five times and my mind gets made up about you, it's hard for me to change. 
And I shouldn't be that way to a certain extent. I should always be thinking the best, think the best, think the best, think the best. That's what love really does. It's always thinking the best. But I'm guilty of that sin. I've done it before. I've heard it before. I've seen it before. I know how this is going to go. And so we've got to resist our pride because we do want to get along with our fellow believers and our family and our coworkers. We don't want them to think less of us because we know, truly we all know this, that once their mind is made up about us, it's really difficult for it to change. So it takes away honor when we show our pride. Verses 36 and 37, this is pretty drastic. Because just like many of you, I grew up in a Baptist church, and we used to say, once saved, always saved. So somebody said a prayer, somebody got baptized, well, then they have to go to heaven. There's no other choice, right? Well, I do believe in the preservation of the saints due to God's power. But let's read verse 36 and verse 37. And then let's let's take a look here at it. Then he took a little child and set him in the midst of them. And when he had taken him in his arms, he said to them, Whoever receives one of these little children in my name receives me. And whoever receives me receives not me, but him who sent me. So this is a child. Maybe it was Peter's kid. They're probably in Peter's house. But what does being a child represent right here? What is Jesus trying to teach? He's trying to teach that this little child has no power and no honor. This child is weak and dependent. This child has accomplished absolutely nothing. And Jesus takes the child in his arms and shows him love and shows him compassion. And Jesus isn't so much saying that you need to go, Jesus loves the little children, which Jesus does love the little children, and we need to love the little children. What Jesus is teaching us here is that the weak the people that don't have anything, the people that have never accomplished anything, the people that struggle day after day after day, the people that just can't get right, all of those people that get on our nerves, what Jesus is teaching is they're just like a little child and you better take them by the arms and you better love them and serve them just like you would the king. Because in my kingdom, this is Jesus talking, in my kingdom, that's how it goes. Is that we serve each other. And we're always putting the other person in front of ourselves. But if we look at Matthew in chapter 18, verses, first couple of verses, I'm going to read them just because I think it's important for us to understand this. And with the heading of no salvation, if pride is getting in your way, if you hold grudges, and if you think that your way is the best way, and you're always disguising it with something, but you're always getting into something that's none of your business, and you're, 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 you're trying to manipulate things. Same story, but written by Matthew instead of Mark. At that time, the disciples came to Jesus saying, Who then is greatest in the kingdom of heaven? Then Jesus called a little child to him, set him in the midst of them, and said, Assuredly, I say to you, unless you are converted and become as little children, you will by no means enter the kingdom of heaven. Ladies and gentlemen, I'm telling you, God will forgive all sin, including the sin of pride. But absolutely right there, he's saying that in his kingdom, he don't want no part of it. And so we have to resist that sin. What does this sin of pride lead to? Exclusive groups of like-minded saints, right? Well, I just over here whispering with this person, or I'm over here hanging out with them, loving and caring more for this person because we're like-minded. We think the same way about this or that or how things should go or what, whatever. You get the point. Y'all have all been in church. I've been in church a long time. I'm pretty good at church. Mark chapter 9, verses 38 through 40. Now John answered Jesus saying, Teacher, we saw someone who does not follow us casting out demons in your name, and we forbade him because he does not follow us. But Jesus said, Do not forbid him, for no one who works a miracle in my name can soon afterwards speak evil of me. For he who is not against us is on our side. Oh, but that's not what we do in life, and that's not what we do sometimes in church. Now, this is John's only time in the Gospel of Mark to step up and kind of speak out on his own. And I think, I'm going to throw the old boy a bone, I think he did it because he felt conviction. He heard and really got it. He understood what Jesus was teaching and saying, and he knew, uh uh-oh, 
we might have been wrong. Because, see, we're close and we're in this inner circle with with Jesus. I just got to see Jesus in all of his glory. I just got to meet Moses and Elijah at the transfiguration of Christ on top of the mountain. I'm pretty special. And those people over there, they haven't got to do any of this. I'm special. We're in an excluded and exclusive little group right here. And so you over there, you quit doing what you're doing because I know best and I'm closest to Jesus. And old John felt conviction. And what Jesus was saying, hey, John, hey, guys, we're on the same team. We all got to get along. Learn how to bite your tongue every once in a while. And if I really wanted to be mean, and I've never had the guts to do this to anybody (laughs) as a pastor, look them straight in the face and point at them and say, grow up. You walk around here and you tell me and you tell others and you act like you're some spiritually mature, great Christian. And all I'm doing is wasting my time when I could be studying, dealing with your pride. But back to some positive stuff. For whoever gives you a cup, verse 41, for whoever gives you a cup of water to drink in my name because you belong to Christ, assuredly I say to you, He will by no means lose his reward. Jesus is teaching these old boys a lesson. A cup of water is not that big a deal. In 2022, a bottle of water is not all that great of a gift. But if you'll just love people and serve them and just give them a little cup of water when they need it, things like that, Jesus is saying, how you treat Christians is going to impact how I treat you. Boy, and if that won't humble us, right? If that won't make us take a deep breath and bite our tongue and look in the mirror and say, I need to grow up because it's going to impact how God blesses me and my family, how I treat these brothers and sisters in Christ. And I'm not talking about just in this church at the church at the beach. I want you to know that I'm talking about some of you are snowbirds. Some of you are just visiting for one Sunday. You need to go back to your churches and you need to let this permeate through your church as well because it's what the word of God says. That we've got to lose the pride. We've got to gain the humility. We must do it God's way, not our own way. But how's this going to transform your life? Remember I said three ways people are going to take this. They're going to have a soft heart. They're going to have a hard heart and get mad at me because somewhere deep inside them, they're going to think I'm talking to them, even though I'm talking to everybody. And literally, it's just the next passage in the book of Mark. Or you're going to come up to me and say, like I said earlier, hey, man, hope Bobby was listening. So if this is going to transform your life, if your hour of being at the church house this morning is going to behoove you, then you need to take this home. Just like I've been taking it home every day all week. You need to take it home for yourself. You need to pray about it. And this is hard to do, but instead of asking God to change somebody else, I got a new idea. Why don't you get down on your knees and you ask God to change you? But I promise you as your pastor, I've been asking God all week to change me. Change me. Maybe if you'll change me, you'll change the others too. shine up